Doom has been a popular subject lately. Hell yeah! Not that doom. More of the metaphysical sense of it. The sense of dread. Oh, okay. Yeah, that doom. Oh. It's a heavy subject, so let's lighten it a little with some rhyming. Okay. <clears throat> it's the doom that looms over your shoulder. The doom in the memes bursting from the seams. You hear it in the news from your peers, and you feel it as you stare at the bottom of the empty cup that used to hold your booze. It's the nebulous thoughts that form our fears, and the cultural anxiety that everything we value, in an instant, we can lose. But that's just the standard issue strife of life, right? It's something we all deal. It's a personal journey, the way we feel. It's not real. But no, everything matters. We all have emotions we're bearing to just appear to look okay. There's the looming specter of expectations of presentation and hearing stories about others lost in the waves. Jealous? Envious, annoyed at those who seem to cruise them so well. And so we escape from reality, festering in the holes we've dug for ourselves. But maybe there's a light. Oh, my rhythm. Because that's strife of life. It's always there. So we might as well just rhyme. Party till the end of time. We want to live while we're here, so we try so hard to persevere. But that overwhelm is so, so heavy. And the movie Surf 2 will be our guide. So come ride this wave with me on this episode of Movies from the Deep. Surf 2 doesn't just have attitude, it is attitude. It begins easing us into the sun-kissed California beaches of legend, playing licensed tunes of Beach Boys, casting an idyllic shadow of nostalgia. Why a shadow? Well, we cut to our main boys hanging on the bleachers, bored by the high school band, game, everything. This really sucks. Let's go. I bet you're familiar with this feeling. I relate because I, too, was once a bored high schooler on the school bleachers. Anyway, a girl, Sparkle, piques their interest. Oh, what's that? That's a girl. But Chuck, Bob, Big Head, Cindy Lou, and Lindy Sue all escape underneath the bleachers, as you do in high school. And Big Head starts eating the fence. Um... As you do. But they can't catch a break, and Beaker, the science teacher, dilutes their bond and totally threatens to narc them, the principal Daddy-O. Well, we'll just have to bring that up with our principal, Mr. Daddy-O. But he can't, because Daddy-O has an announcement. Two students had terrible surfing accidents at the beach, so they urge them not to surf. I said they met with a terrible surfing accident. The mere mention sends the restless students into a frenzy and they rush to go surfing. But they're met with the police blockade as the bumbling chief Boy R.D. I want you to dust the beach for prints. And his charming deputy, Inspector Underwear, <laughs> proved to be yet another obstacle. I want you to keep all those kids in school until I crack this case. However, that attitude, that disdain for school, that hunger to surf is too strong. No problem, Chief. And Let's they bet. bum rush the beach with swirling hormonal teenage gusto as we see ourselves careening cluelessly through the sublime abyss of Surf 2. But before we cowabunga, let me tell you how this beauty bubbled up. The writer-director of this film, Randall M. Badat, was surfing one day and he split his face open. So he got stitched up at the hospital, got some real good drugs, attended a party where he became inspired. And he cut those pain meds with whiskey and Adderall and Surf 2 was born that night in its early form, Surf Death. Somehow, this rough draft of a sequel to a movie that doesn't exist got made with big names. Eddie Deason, Terry Kaiser, Eric Stoltz, Morgan Paul, Cleavon Little, and my personal favorite, Linda Carriage, who is a cult film legend and is likely still the greatest Australian Marilyn Monroe lookalike to this day. It's incredible. You've got all these known and outstanding faces just throwing their talent at this bender-fueled chaos with airplane-style puns. Or, more recently, internet memes. That immediacy, that rawness to how those styles of art function is key to Surf 2. Except, I'm not actually sure it knows it. It's a raw reaction. What is more raw than disrespect for authority? Any particular authority figure in this movie is kind of bumbling. So come on out with your fan. Is that fans? No, it's hands, it's hands. Right. To okay. use some surf terms, there are the crumbly waves, the first in line to dissipate to a much bigger one, the double up wave of authority. Capitalism. Our main boys' dads are a unit. They own an old oil refinery, and what do they produce? Buzz Cola, a soft drink. 
That seems weird, huh? Yeah, and everyone who drinks it doesn't look so good either. We see what it looks like, too, and it looks exactly like something made in an oil refinery. A duck's a duck, I suppose. But the town is already addicted. Pretty rad. And just as the soda doesn't make any sense for consumption, the dads aren't really in tune with anything, except each other, really. We see this incongruent attitude towards the kids who are helping them move boxes. They vaguely try to relate, but they don't really care. Uh, whip it wet, huh? Hang 11. Uh, tuber City. Buzz power. Right. They're making money from poison. And they're honest when confronted, but you guessed it, they don't care. So you're just trying to force that crap soda of yours on the kids so you two can make a fortune and you can get your stupid revenge on the surfers. Oh, I'd say she's just about hit the nail on the head. Well, you guys better be going. And they're also trying to sabotage their sons in a surfing contest to get their product featured somewhere, I guess. It's kind of vague. But you see this small unit of two selfish people who have established this addictive substance at the expense of an entire town deliberately undermining their own children and no one is there to stop them. But at least their kids know it's bad. Here, why don't you have a soda and let's talk? Buzz? Yeesh. I wouldn't drink that crap if you paid me. Oh, and Chuck and Bob, our main boys, sons of the dads, well, they don't fall far from the tree. Like the dads, they are a freaking unit. They are one with each other, one with their emotions, and they have a bit of a bromance going. It's cute. What'd you do? What do you mean why? You were there. I know, man. I just love to hear you tell it. It was my Unsurprisingly, fault. they're attractive, popular, have solid families, friends, girlfriends, and they're able to focus on their surfing hobby. They're privileged, and they have community. Look at this scene. Hi, Mom. Morning, Morning Dad. 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 What's, What's for breakfast? breakfast? Literally in sync with each other. This shows they're a family that has brought up their kids with close relations by using a broad parody of the 50s homogenized aesthetic. It's really striking. The dads are urging the kids at the public beach. Now their only option to surf should be fine. There's been a good south swell running on an incoming tide. I bet there'll be some bitchin' tubes. I beg your pardon. There hasn't been a makeable tube on that beach since they dredged the marina and laid the jetty. It's strictly shore pound city. The moms and the kids, they don't agree. And as we already know, the moms are more on the mark. This illustrates the comparison we'll be seeing more of. Chuck and Bob, they have that nuclear family thing going. Raised well and are, on the surface, pretty alright. Because while Chuck and Bob don't know their dads are plotting, they're in the moment. They can take things as they come, so it's not that much of a bother. But this film indulges in a lot more comparison and it's rarely so positive. When Chuck and Bob arrive at the public beach, they approach some ladies, despite their girlfriends. So very little flirtatious. They're boys. Young, blonde, thin, muscular surf boys with clear skin. Perfect. Shut up, shut up, shut up. And Sparkle up, desires them, and Menlo judges them, and we witness the ugly, voracious black hole of comparison eclipsing the sunshine in California dreaming. Sparkle and Menlo Schwarzer are the odd outcasts. Menlo is obvious. He's the nerdy dude with the glasses and nasally voice. Contest next week? Yeah, they're ready. What about yours? But Sparkle is less so. She's got that Marilyn Monroe look and is ogled by most of the guys that she kind of hunches over and hangs with the nerd dude. What's up with that? It turns out Menlo uses his vague nerd science ability to make Sparkle look beautiful. The kids laughed at us. At least we had some fun. Look at this. Remember her? Do you remember? This is what she used to look like as Florinda Butnick, and that's the carrot and stick to make her stay with him. She doesn't like it. Here, put this on. This will keep you beautiful for a few more hours. But she goes along with it. She doesn't want to look like she used to again, but in exchange, she needs to lure unsuspecting surfers into Menlo's lair. where he force feeds them Buzz Cola and turns them into Buzz Cola zombie servants who are also surf pros. Standard tropes, right? But why does Menlo do this? Well, he's resentful of being the outcast and he's jealous of the surfers. Do you know how many brain surgeons, nuclear physicists, and Nobel laureates have been surfers? I'll tell you, none. So he's using everything in his power to get his revenge. Just like Sparkle, he's overcompensating and ropes her into it because he sees her similar desire to fit in aesthetically with the popular pretty girls. 
but neither of them are happy. And the heart of the problem for the teens in Surf 2 lies with the aesthetic. We've already seen how Chuck and Bob slide through, just being beautiful, perfect people, much to the chagrin of their girlfriends. You could pay a little bit more attention to us. It's a wing. Sparkle and Menlo overcompensate for their own perceived deficiencies. But what about Big Head? Well, he seems to not give a fuck about aesthetics, normal social cues, or even laws. <laughs> This catchphrase is bad. It must be from LA. A bow bow. A bow bow. A bow bow. But speaking of comparison, his family portrayal could not be more different than Chuck and Bob's. There's trash everywhere, he throws his little brother into it, his mother barely noticing. Something's very wrong here. But the film doesn't develop its characters deeply, so we don't see much of it. But from what we do know, he represents a reaction to cultural anxiety. His defiance of aesthetic is this film's portrayal of a fantasy. All this cultural nonsense the movie indulges in, Big Head just charges through. Can't. It says it's out of order. No matter. I can't read. <laughs> He flattens it, treating it all as meaningless social constructs, and really he's a refreshing foil to the slavish devotion to aesthetic all around him. However, one boy's defiance may not be enough, as aesthetics have long ago opened the rifts for others to exploit the community. consuming maw gapes open with a manic beach bash. We see the crowd getting weird to the bangers of Dick Dale and the Untouchables. And it feels uncomfortable, like not enjoyment, but a manic coping mechanism. But the kids go with it until Big Head gets challenged to a junk eating contest by the Buzz Cola zombified Jocko, brother of Cindy Lou and Lindy Sue. They eat beach crap, broken glass, and more. But then comes the Buzz Cola. Oh no. And even Chuck and Bob are like, oh shit, but it's a dare, you gotta do it. Come on, Big Head. This one's for the money. But Big Head mercifully passes out. This drives home just how bad Buzz is. Eating some random washed up beach crap is literally better for you. It's so extreme it shifts to body horror, and the party erupts into violence. <laughs> The partiers are sucked into Menlo's lair. Chuck, Bob, Sparkle, and an errant zombie escape to Beaker's house. Beaker eagerly dissects the boy because they think he is dead. He's not. But he does it anyway. I thought you said he was dead. Maybe he was sleeping. Not anymore. This film is extremely irreverent, but this is its peak. With a science teacher happily mutilating an innocent boy poisoned against his will by a force of ferocious, uncaring greed, and playing it for laughs. This is not a comedy and should not be viewed as one. Google even says it right there. It's horror. And the film's treating it as comedy is abhorrent and disgusting. And, hear me out? That's a good thing. The way the film portrays horror is manic. The way the citizens of the town feverishly respond to the events is disassociative. If he keeps indulging like that, I don't think Jocko's gonna give us much trouble in the surf contest. And the way they distract themselves, ignoring glaring issues like the Buzz Cola zombies, is so fucking familiar. He's right. If you're worried about your kids, lock them up. Beat them. Do anything you damn well please, but for Christ's sake, don't stop innocent kids from drinking cola and surfing. It's the American way. Absolutely. Like everyone is preoccupied with something. Even the movie just wants to surf. It goes on tangents where it's just showing surf shots with music. And we do get a happy ending. Big Head is the catalyst. He bum rushes Menlo's lair and sends it all to heck. And we learn that Menlo has boobs and that's a big problem for him. Reverse sex hormone. Do you know what it's like to be the only guy on the beach with tits? It's Pretty miserable. standard transphobia from an older movie, basically just showing his emasculation. Pretty gross. But the dads have also been turned into women at the end as well, also to emasculate them in their failed attempt to make it big with their product. And that's how the horror develops. It's all about fear. Fear of not being pretty enough, fear of not being successful, fear of truth. But it's all surface level. Nothing has been addressed by the end. It shows the town back to a semblance of normalcy. Chuck, Bob, the movie, get to surf again, and the status quo looks normal enough. That's not a happy ending. 
It doesn't address the insecurities of the teenagers. It doesn't confront the rampant exploitation and casual cruelty they're reacting to. It just shows it. That's where the sense of doom comes from. It's a chaotic cultural whirlwind that is hypnotizing. But it's also hypnotized by itself, hence the surf shots. The whole film is a constant reaction, a coping mechanism about people with coping mechanisms isolating themselves and it doesn't do anything about them. We're left washed up at shore, shaken but not okay. But this movie frame has edges, and this film has an end. It simplifies its complex subject matter to form this tacky, sublime, and miasmatic who's packing it in a neat little box to hand write to us. I want to disconnect, and this film won't let me. And if I can't chill, then fuck it. Just as Surf 2 wants to surf, it's time I badly rhyme. <coughs> The stream of the memes help us cut the confusion to acknowledge our dream. But what we need is a vision through with a team. To acknowledge the needs of others, we must find truth within ourselves, dust our feelings off the shell. So we can make art for its sake, it can be good, it can be bad. It's that we're making it, which is rad. But that awareness through art can't just be a fad. It may feel like we must swear fealty, but with effort we can trek to a place of respect. And gosh dang can it feel unwieldy, but keep a lookout on the way we ride because there's always time for a joyful imbibe to confront our feelings we put to the side in a space with a big old honest gosh darned vibe thanks for watching <laughs>